Hello, World Wide Web. I'm Becca Shadow, the internet personality with the best hair. And I'm fucking ecstatic that the summer of Seagal is finally over and we can move on to some more interesting actors, like... Kurt Russell? You may remember that I loved this man's performance in the 1998 film Soldier, as it's not hard for me to understand that having next to no lines and few emotions is not simply a lack of acting prowess, but conversely, an example of one spectrum of his range of character. I also don't know why people didn't get that. It's not like Soldier was his first movie, and he's played very different characters before, such as his portrayal as David Grant in the 1996 movie Executive Decision. Set in an absolutely massive transatlantic airliner, Executive Decision has Kurt Russell as an intelligence officer who finds himself on site with a special ops team trying to stop a group of terrorists from using a passenger jet as a weapon for an attack against the U.S. Yeah, I know what it sounds like. Uh, no, that wasn't intentional. If it were, I should have reviewed this last week. Anyway, let's take a look at Executive Decision and see if it soars to new heights, or crashes and... Wait. Am I allowed to say that? After the opening credits to booming music, we find ourselves outside a miscellaneous building being given the tell-don't-show explanation of what's going on. If the nerve toxin was stolen from the Soviets, then shouldn't the Soviets be the ones trying to recover it and not the U.S. Special Armed Forces? This introduces our team with Hubley, Joe Morton, John Leguizamo, B.D. Wong, and last but not least... No. No! No, 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 no! Why? Why? Anyway, Seagal plays Austin Travis, the leader of this team, who seems to specialize in sneaking up on people and shooting the fuck out of them before they can return fire with those weapons they don't have. After they plow through all the guards, they find out that they were all guarding... nothing. It always sucks after you've completed a dungeon and then you find out that the reward is glitched and you're gonna have to waste your time filing out a bug report. Fast forward three months later, and we find Kurt Russell is learning to fly, just a spare hobby he has on the side, and his instructor thinks he's ready to take his first solo flight. He's apprehensive, but anxious to try, but of course that means he can't, as the plot interrupts us. It's happened! Okay, what happened? Something that looks like it was chopped up and edited in from another movie. Impressive, especially considering, as far as my research shows, that's not actually what happened. What did happen, however, was the glorious work of the Defenders of Freedom who calmly apprehended this dangerous terrorist in a way that didn't upset bystanders in the slightest. Strangely, Kurt, who happens to be an intelligence officer, doesn't think that's the case, and expresses his concerns the only way he knows how. An aviation pun! Well, we wanted him and now we got him. Claiming a violation of territorial sovereignty has launched an emergency protest with the UN Security Council and all the baggage that goes with it. Until this company no, don't worry, his baggage got lost on the way over and ended up in Cairo. Or in London, as despite it clearly being the Americans that pulled off this stunt, don't let that get in the way of this little demonstration. Of course, that was just a warning shot. If it were real, it would have been in America. But England? Who gives a fuck about them? Honestly, this was just a demonstration to show they're serious, because otherwise, when their main group pulls out all those assault rifles and demand to take control of this airplane, you've gotta admit, there's a legitimate chance everyone might just think they're joking. And I know before 9-11 we weren't doing mandatory cavity searches before flight, but still, how the fuck did they get all of those weapons onto the plane? Well, the movie feels that's one question not worth answering, or even bringing up as they've got to figure out what to do about the hijacking, as the perpetrator was kind enough to call them up right away to let them know. His demands for their leader to be set free result in a meeting between all the important characters, including Russell and Seagal. Russell uses his powers of intelligence to say that their miscellaneous unseen research tells them that they wanted Yaffa to get kidnapped, so they may orchestrate this flight as a strike against the United States with their payload of Soviet nerve toxin they've got kicking around. Okay, how the fuck did that end up getting on the plane? Seems to me the president has two options. And let that plane proceed to the United States, or destroy it before it gets here, along with 406 passengers. Even if we're right, how would we ever prove it? Who 
cares? Shoot it down and get the fuck out of there before anyone knows what happened. You're acting like there would be witnesses over the Atlantic. Not to worry, though, Seagal has a much more complicated idea. With the help of Oliver Platt, he proposes the use of a stealth aircraft to attach itself to the underside of the jet, sending his anti-terrorism unit in to save the day. Well, sir, we're going to need all the on-site intel we can get. And I think that Mr. Grant could provide us with a great advantage. And I'd just love to have him come along. Also, as a side quest, he'd like to see if he can get Russell killed. Yeah, Seagal's kind of a dick in this movie. I mean, his character is actually written that way for once. Because there's no time to waste, they assemble in minutes, and with the help of their unnecessarily high-tech airplane blueprint, formulate the perfect plan to infiltrate. Or perhaps just have Seagal assert his superior dickitude to Russell some more, and end up in an argument when he doesn't understand that the tech guy is better for the tech stuff in the highly technical docking maneuver. Colonel, I'll clip your circuit for you from the ladder. There's no reason for me to go in the plane. That's the way it's gonna be. You don't understand. I'm an engineer. My That's plane... it! I kind of figured that there would be extenuating circumstances that would have him wind up on the plane somehow, but I didn't think that it would just be that Seagal is that much of an asshole. They have the tense scene of the approach and link-up, followed by the extra tension of climbing the ladder. But suddenly, the airplanes just start flailing around for no apparent reason, and Russell decides to climb up onto the plane that he wasn't supposed to, because, after all, that makes saving the guy trapped in the tube much easier. Which means that the only one who hasn't made it up yet is Seagal! Am I really supposed to think for a second that... That might happen. Seagal just... died? <laughs> Seagal just died. Seagal died. Seagal is dead! <laughs> Seagal is dead! 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 Oh yeah, he's down into the bottom with the Atlantic, yes he is! Yeah. Woo! <sighs> yeah! The stealth doesn't survive either. Or the pilot, for that matter. Yeah, I know he ejected, but still, they're hundreds of miles from any land. He's fucking dead. However, this means that there's no one left to confirm the boarding was a success, making their already small window of opportunity even smaller. Now it's time for more tension as the crazy flying has led the terrorists to request a pilot checks the avionics room to find out what was going on, instead of just checking it themselves. Good thing, too, because if they checked, they would have found the soldiers in this movie would have been over far too soon. Fortunately, they're perfectly happy with the fried chips the pilot offers them, so we get the next big crisis as they figure out how long they have until the Air Force shoots them down. Baker, how much time before we hit U.S. airspace? Three hours and fifty minutes. Oh, you'll be fine. The movie's only two hours and ten. But they can't just rush in guns blazing because there's that hypothetical Soviet nerve gas bomb thing on board, and they have to find it. And they just so happen to have a nerve agent tracker tool thing. Plus, despite the tension being incredibly high and everyone on their toes, not one of the 400 passengers takes note of John Leguizamo drilling holes for snake cams. The tension is dialed even higher as Russell has to check each cam to see if he can spot the group's leader, but if he steps on the panels, he'll fall right through. Now, one thing you might have noticed, there's not really that much action in this action movie. It's mostly tension. Well done tension, but a lot of it. He doesn't find their leader anyway, so he has to go back with extreme tension. I'm not really concerned about the terrorists, more so the harness crushing his nuts every time he slips. This time, as he's being lowered down, he's suddenly spotted by Halle Berry, and we get another tense scene as he must choose to get out of there while she prevents one of them from seeing him, or stick around and stare up her skirt like he's doing. After this, we're introduced to Senator Mavros, played by James Walsh. The fuck? Uh, oh, James T. 
Thomas Patrick Walsh. I thought he looked different. He has a chat with the leader, Nagi Hassan, played by David Suchet, because all this tension needs a little subplot to mix things up. I can deal directly with the president. If you allow me to conduct the negotiation, I believe I can guarantee all your demands. Money, media exposure, safe passage back to the Middle East. Sure, I mean, they had this kind of scene in Die Hard, so why not? Well, shit, are you fucking crazy, James? You're just suicidal! He's jumping the gun a bit here, though, so he puts the offer on the back burner. The troops have something a bit more pressing to take center stage for a bit. You can forget Washington. There's enough nerve agent here to wipe out half the eastern seaboard. Yeah, but what if there's a crosswind? What if all the nerve agent just drifts back into the Atlantic? Maybe ten people die. If that. As it's been an hour already and no word from the squad, they decide to go ahead and release El Said Yafa, even though they completely intend to shoot down the airplane anyway. I can assure you that plane will never be allowed to reach the United States. So why bother letting him go? And if it was his plan the whole time for Yafa to be captured so that he could pull this off, what reason did he need for that to happen? He needed a motive to explain his motive? He could have just captured it from the start and gone in unnoticed without calling everybody and letting them know. And that also means that suicide bomber earlier was kind of a waste. Sucks to be him. Wait, they've got to defuse the bomb, whose trigger mechanism is more than a little complicated. So they get the computer nerd to help, as their demolitions expert is not doing as good as he could be. Yeah, when the planes were smashing around earlier, he was the one hanging upside down in the tube. But it's a good thing they brought that neck brace with them. Everyone else loads up and gets in position to take the plane by force as soon as the bomb is defused, which means, you guessed it, another long scene of tension building upon tension. Well, of course they were going to clip the right one. Seagal might not be alive anymore, but usually action movies don't end with everyone fucking up and getting themselves killed. Oh, uh, never mind. The attack is called off, which is the equivalent of an action movie cock tease, as it turns out someone has wireless control of the bomb, which means a remote trigger, and the demolitions expert passes out on top of it. On the situation the government is trying to defuse, strangely enough, despite them freeing Yaffa, Hassan very clearly still plans to bomb DC. Nashi, listen to me! They know! They will destroy the plane, Nashi! Listen! Man, he will not give up that first class cabin for nothing. Still, he tells his terrorist buddies about their newly freed leader, despite the fact that evidently they didn't know that they were supposed to die during this super suicide bombing run. Not the smartest terrorist cell he managed to scrounge up. And maybe he was the only one who had a problem with it, as the other half a dozen heavily armed guys do nothing to stop him because, hey, he's got a pistol. These events lead Russell to believe that the rest of the group really doesn't know about the bomb, so the trigger man has to be a random guy hidden amongst the passengers. Though if that's all he's working off of, there's no reason to think that it's not Hassan who has the trigger. What ruled that out? I see we hit him now, forget about that bomb, and maybe we're gonna get lucky. Even if you kill them all, the sleeper can still destroy the plane. I feel like every other actor wants desperately for this to be an action movie, while Russell keeps trying to talk them into doing film noir. So we get more... slow, tense scenes, as they continue to disarm the bomb, while also doing what they can to find the sleeper. Russell figures their best bet is to get some use out of casting Halle Berry, and actually have her do something! I'm watching you on video. Not the best opening statement you could have picked. He explains the situation well enough, but not quite fast enough. That's eight dollars and forty cents per minute! Well, that's what you get. Get him, wizard. Or not? Wait, why the fuck didn't he shoot her? He's already established he's more than willing to kill someone, and it's not like she's the only stewardess on the plane. Probably because otherwise she wouldn't be alive to agree to help them. It doesn't take long before she spots something and lets the guys know. No time to deal with that, though. We've got to have another tension-building scene. Wow. 
really fucked up that one. But it's okay, they have an extra life, and it turns out this overly complicated detonator was the dummy overly complicated detonator, while the real overly complicated detonator is below it. We're gonna need something non-metallic to slip between those points. Cahill. Yeah, the plastic won't carry a charge. Well, that saliva, on the other hand... Before we get too far with this, however, we've got to finish off that scene they ripped off a of Die Hard. I don't care where he is. I want to speak to him right now. You got that? Senator, I'm in charge of the crisis team. No. Oh, no. They have a gun to my head. Please, just do what they want. Please. Please, just do what they want! Please! And, uh, how is killing one man on the plane supposed to stop them from blasting the whole thing down with missiles? He was going to die anyway, in both cases. Now that the fighter jets came a knockin', Russell and Hubley figure out in mere minutes which wires to cross to grant them control over the tail lights, buying them more time using them for Morse code. Leguizamo is still not happy just waiting around while Russell insists on giving them more time to defuse the bomb. Five minutes, Rat. They'll have the bomb defused by then, I know it. Now give it five minutes! Rat, give him the five minutes. Rat, I agree. All right, Grant. I think according to this movie, he's been standing in that little cubby for like an hour and a half. No wonder he's pissed. We've only got five minutes. How you doing? Grant, where the hell have you been? This sphere is filled with photoelectric beams. It's gonna take us a hell of a lot longer than five minutes. Hey, uh, just wondering, couldn't they get some kind of transparent plastic and just stick it in there without worrying about the laser trip wires? Not certain if that would work, but it's better than just sitting here and watching them play this game of irritating stick. After waiting only an hour and 50 minutes for them to do something, finally Russell is getting into the position to take out the sleeper, but... Oh no! It was the wrong guy! Bullshit. Earlier in this movie, they showed many, many shots of him, and he clearly had an electronic device with a keyboard, not a box of diamonds. So this movie lied to us! They fucking lied to us! Yeah, I know I'm making a bit of a big deal out of it, but here's the thing, if you'll allow me to make an alien reference. In Alien, after Ripley escapes in the shuttle, everyone remembers the surprise as to what else happened to be coming along with her. The reason that worked, but this didn't, is because they did not lie to us in Alien. Earlier, as she was running into the shuttle, if you look, you can see the alien hiding just where he appears later in the movie. So, yeah, unless you're going for comedy, the only thing I'm going to call the detonator into diamonds trick is a continuity error. The real sleeper is all the way in the back, so Russell rushes forth, can't reach him very easily at all, and despite having no idea who it really was before getting in there, he still has more than enough time to stop him. Which means that all this time that Lake was almost spent waiting in the closet was pretty much wasted, as they could have just rushed in at any time and had the same results. After a slightly more realistic example of what happens when you use firearms on an airplane, and an unrealistic example of people continuing to breathe comfortably despite the lack of oxygen, not to mention Hassan still kicking despite being shot in the back, he kills the pilots before being taken out. Again. I know it's normal action movie fair, but after they spent so long establishing all this precision and significance, it's more than a little disorienting. This leads to where anyone could have predicted it would, as on this 400-passenger jet, Russell is the only one with any training as a pilot whatsoever! This would be our climactic tension scene, but here's the problem. They can't deliver tension with the excitement of landing a jet and keeping it steady, so they do it by making sure everything he tries just keeps going wrong! After the rest of the film was so serious, this just comes off as unintentionally comedic. There. 60, there we go, 150, 140... On top of that, he misses his runway because, hey, he was slightly too high. So he makes the brilliant decision to divert to the airport he's familiar with, which certainly is not designed to land aircraft of this size, resulting in a landing I think is a lot rougher than the one he would have had if he just overshot the last runway, especially considering that's what he's doing here anyway. Never mind that, though. Happy ending! Everyone is safe, nobody seems particularly heartbroken about their family getting sucked out of the side of the plane earlier, and Russell gets to keep Halle Berry as a consolation prize. You know, uh, not all that much happened in the movie. I don't think it needed to be over two hours long when, honestly, I'm having a difficult time stretching this review to 20 minutes. Anyway, that was Executive Decision, and... 
I mean, it's got its ups and downs. It's got a good cast, and they all give good performances. Kurt Russell does a good job in the starring role. Not fantastic, but his range of emotions in this film is wide enough that I don't have to point between this and Soldier to prove the man can act. I can point to only this. The rest of the characters don't get quite as much of an opportunity to show much depth, but they are distinctive and reasonably entertaining. The overall structure of the events, though, is somewhat hit and miss. It's built up and explained well enough for most action films, but the problem comes from the fact that this movie really tries to be more than that. Its main focus is on the heart-in-your-throat tension involved in actions as precarious and risky as dancing on a nice edge. And this is done well, but the basic action movie plot flaws in logic and inconsistencies hurt it a lot more because of that. Not to mention that there's just so much of it. The climax really failed to excite me. I'm all for comedy with my action, but I don't think that's what they were intending with this scene. Overall, Executive Decision has a good presentation and tries to be greater than your average action movie, but because it's still written just about as well as one, it can't seem to rise above the median. But wait, did we forget about Seagal? I have to say, after watching so many of his movies, this film has used him in the best way I've seen, both in the fact that he's not the infallible hero, and he dies! Actually, maybe just that he dies. Oh boy, does he die. That's worth a whole star right there, allowing Executive Decision to come in at four convenient flight lessons out of five. It's a shame they didn't kill Seagal more than once. I might have rated it even higher for that. Or hell, just have a two-hour reel of nothing but Seagal getting killed over and over and over again. Thank you all for watching, I've been Decker Shadow, and remember, in case of Steven Seagal surviving a water landing, your forehead may be used as a percussion device. It always sucks after you complete a dungeon. Yes? Hi. What is going on with you? I am trying to get on top of covers. Naked? I am doing something else entirely. What's that? I am filming. Oh, did I call you in the middle of filming? Nah. You sure? I can hang up and walk to the key too. Well, let's put it this way. This is making it to the blooper reel. Oh, okay. <laughs> In that case, Venus, 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 Venus. Thank you for that. <laughs>